I have another budget knife I want to share with you today. This is the BSH3 Bushcraft knife from the company Beavercraft, made in Ukraine. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on this knife, keep watching. All right, quickly, just before we get started, I want to thank Beavercraft for sending me this knife so that I could share it with you. In fact, they sent me this knife and their small hatchet, which I'll review separately at a later time. So what I'll do, of course, is I'll bring you in a little closer, give you all the features of this knife, go over the design, and of course, we'll do some demonstrations. Before we take a closer look at the knife, I wanted to share the sheath with you so we can put that out of the way. So let me take the knife out of the sheath, put it aside. So the sheath is made of a good looking type of leather. It's not suede. I believe they refer to this as nubuck. So it's a split type leather. Um, it is got a dangler and a belt loop. And to use a belt loop, just drop the dangler down out of the way. Retention is accomplished with a strap and a button knob, there's a name for that I'm sure, with a little hole right here that you would close over it. Uh, you know, it's not a bad looking sheath, but honestly, I don't like it. And the reason is it's just soft, flexible. And while that may or may not affect the performance of the sheath and the safety of it and the retention of it, the thing that, uh, the next thing about the sheath is that I just feel this is a bit flimsy on this side. It's functional, it's just not something I want to depend on. It just doesn't feel like it matches the quality the rest of the way through. All right, so let's put the sheath aside. Oh, I guess I can show you the retention strap in action and then put the sheath aside. So find it around. So you can see it's on there. Now, this, it's not bad, but you can see it does move around in the sheath. So. Yeah, I suppose if I give it a little tug, it's probably going to come right out. And in doing so, probably slice through the retention strap. So the sheath is not what I would like it to be. All right, now we're going to get into the specifications for the knife, and then we'll talk about the design. So let's get the specs out of the way first. Overall length, 9.64 inches, 245 millimeters. Blade length. 4.72 inches, 120 millimeters. Blade thickness, it's a thin blade, is 0 0.098 of an inch, which is 2.5 millimeters. Blade height, 1.38 inches, 35 millimeters. It is made from 1066 carbon steel, hardened to between 58 and 60 on the Rockwell scale. The handle length, just as an extra piece of information, is 4.92 inches, 125 millimeters. The handle material is listed as walnut. All right, let me put the specs aside. Side. Of course, I'm going to give you all that information in the video description so that you can go back and reference it. Let's look at the design of the knife itself. So starting with the blade, it does have a drop point. So if there's a continuous gradual sweep towards the tip, the tip is quite fine. It's quite broad top to bottom. It does have a Scandinavian grind on the bottom, but there is a very, very micro uh, secondary edge on it. Not enough to affect the geometry in any great manner. I know some people like a true zero grind. I actually prefer a micro on it. Part of that might be as shiny as it is because uh, as far as sharpening goes so far, and I might as well say this now, I have not put this to stones, uh, but I have stropped it and run it down ceramic number numerous times. Let's put it that way. And that just goes with my philosophy of don't let it get dull to the point where you have to put it on stones. I mean, eventually I will. But if you can maintain the edge, that's better than allowing it to get dull and then having to go through a complete sharpening job. That's just my philosophy there. So as a result, you can see the secondary edge a little bit more. And uh, yeah. Okay. Right off the top, it should be very obvious, the steel is blued. So it has been blued to protect, at least help protect against rust. So let's just talk about that for a moment. Because I know someone is going to comment on the steel. 1066 high carbon steel. Someone's going to say it is junk. Well, let's just address that. So there is, I guess, four things I like to consider when I'm looking at a tool like a knife. A knife a hatchet, a saw, any outdoor tool, any tool for that matter, that involves having a sharp edge on it. First off, what is the intended purpose of this? What is this design supposed to give you uh, the ability to do? All right, that's number one. Number two is 
is the grind and the, the design itself uh, suitable to the steel? So does the steel match the intended purpose? Does the shape of the blade and the grind match the intended purpose? What about the steel itself? Is What is the steel? And finally, and probably most important, is what is the heat treat. So if you combine those things together, that's what makes a, a, a good choice in terms of steel for a knife. And, I, and there's a reason I say that, and I'll give you the best example I know of, and that's Axis. Uh, this is a 1066 carbon steel. Yes, there are much uh, steels with much higher carbon content, which theoretically will give you longer edge holding. And that while that is true, if they're not well heat treated, they can't take advantage of the better steel. Take an axe, for instance. A lot of axes are made of 1045, 1055, or something with the same amount of carbon steel. They're and not hardened to the same degree that a knife edge is, and that's because they're meant to take impacts a lot more than a knife would, and an impact that if it was hardened to the same degree a knife was, would chip out the edge. So the design of the tool is completely different for a different purpose. So I guess that brings us back to this knife. Is this a good choice of steel for this knife? Well, uh, a couple things to say there. It depends on the heat treat. I can say the heat treat on this is sufficient to the task. It won't, or the edge won't last as long as other steels that I've reviewed or other knives, but it makes it that much easier to sharpen. So it's not junk by any means. It's, it's a budget steel. It all depends on the maker of the knife and how they heat treat it. And in this case, Beavercraft does a good heat treat on their knives. So I just wanted to address that. That's what you're getting for your money. Budget materials, but well put together in combination with a good design. All right, so we've uh, touched on the blade. By the way, I had a friend um, contact me recently to mention that he had one of the BPS knives get very, very rusty on him. And he mentioned that it was in its sheath. It was in his house, it wasn't wet, it wasn't moisture, but yet it still got rusty. And, uh, you know, okay, in fairness to him, he, he wasn't aware of the fact that leather would draw moisture out of the air, and if it's in contact with the metal, and it's a high carbon steel, not a stainless steel, it can still cause rust. So a couple things I suggested. Number one is always, well, one, you should, if you can, store the knife separately from the sheath, especially if it's a leather sheath. Number two, oil the blade with some type of a protectant coating on the outside of it to minimize the chances of the rust. Number three is some type of a coating on the blade that you can do yourself. You can hold cold blue the steel of your knife and give it some protection that way. And you can also put a forced patina on with vinegar or mustard. There's lots of videos and directions on how to do that. All those things together, you still have to maintain it. If it does rust, get rid of the rust. Just get rid of it as quickly as you can and, and any way you want to and maintain it. It's not the end of the world if your blade gets a little rusty. It may not look as pretty, but in my mind, it shows use. Just don't let it show neglect. I guess that would be my, my uh, caution there. All right, let's just finish off by showing that it does have a sharpening chaw right here. The walnut scales are held on by Allen uh, nuts on both sides. They're not uh, Torx, but they are Allen to the best of what I can see on them. Yep, they're Allen. And uh, yeah, so it's a full tang knife, as you can see, a full broad tang, no uh, lanyard hole on the end of it. The walnut is just flat finished. There's no special stain, no sealant on the outside of it. Okay, so blade shape. I mentioned that it was a drop point, comes up to quite a fine point on it. It's actually pretty good for carving. It's got quite a good point there. You'll see when I, when I do the demonstrations. It is thin, and normally that wouldn't be a great thing for a bushcraft knife. If it's too thin, it doesn't stand up well to batoning, but because it's got this height, then it makes up for it in steel. And the fact that it is full thickness steel right down until the the uh, primary grind, the Scandi, I'm gonna say in this in this case, starts. So it's plenty strong for a reasonable amount of batoning. We'll talk more about that. Handle shape. Now, here's where um, this is gonna be my opinion, of course. It is plenty long. It actually is long enough. Look at that. For me, extra large hands, I am holding it a bit forward, extra large hands, and the pommel does extend out past the end of my hand. I was quite surprised and pleased by that. I also like the height to width or depth ratio. So it is feels good in the hand. It's not likely to want to twist and roll like something that's too round is. It is contoured nicely over the top. It's, it's not, uh, yeah, it's just nice. It's smooth. There's no 
edges, fin you know, poking through, nothing sharp to catch you on. Uh, it's just good, I guess. It's not showcase or showpiece special is the, is the thing I'll, I'll say about it. There is a bit of a contour right here for, it makes it, let's show it this way, laying my thumb on comfortably without, you know, having an edge poking into my thumb when I'm using it in that grip or in this grip. Now, here's the thing that I dislike about it. So when I got the knife, I looked at it, I said, that's a strange shape. Like, it just seemed to taper off too much towards the end. I said, oh, well, you know, looks aren't everything. Let's put it in hand and see how it functions. By and large, forward cuts like this, it works really well. I have no comment or no criticisms at all. It's when I turn the knife around and place my thumb on the side of the blade that this sticks into the, this part, the fleshy portion of my hand. And I said, you know, that feels a little uncomfortable. What does it feel like if I do the chest lever cut? And you'll see me do that in a few minutes time. It feels very uncomfortable. So after, you know, one or two cuts is not so bad, but if you're doing a lot of work in this grip position here, that's actually sharp. I mean, not sharp enough to cut you, but very, very pointed. It's brought off to a, let's see if I can bring it right up. You can see how pointed off to an edge it came. So yeah, I, I'm not a fan of that. Uh, okay, that's gonna be an easy fix. I just wanted to leave it on that way to show you in the video, but I am gonna round it off. It just, you know, the proportions look a little out of whack, a little bit too thin back here, but functionally it still works except for that one thing where it lays against my hand in that position. Okay, uh, yes, it does have a 90 degree spine. It is quite sharp. It's got a bit of a burr on it. As you'll see when we go to do some scraping, it'll scrape just fine as well. I guess the only thing left to do now is to put it through a few tests. All right, demonstration number one is batoning. So what I have is a length of seasoned maple, which is about 14 inches in length, inch and three quarters to two inches in diameter. This is as big as I'd likely uh, use, or likely, yeah, use this knife on to baton. It may baton something a little bit thicker because it's certainly got the span to do so. But uh, after this point, I'm probably looking for a larger tool, an ax or one of my bigger knives for splitting wood. So yeah, this is as far as I'd like to, to go. It's still a thin steel knife, right? But it's certainly capable of doing this as you will see. So let's do exactly that. Let's break her down into quarters at least. That's hard wood. Hard, but wet on the outside. Woo! All right, so nice and hard on the inside. A little bit of it punky, but most of it is still very, very hard wood. So just an observation in doing that batoning. This is not the best batoner in the world. So reason enough to bring another tool with you when you're batoning. The reason it's not a great batoner is because of how thin it is. Uh, a blade with a, a th or a knife with a thicker blade or any other tool with, with more width to it is going to split the wood faster simply because it's more of a wedge. Now, I just noticed there is another reason why this has probably suffered a little bit or not suffered, struggled a, a tiny bit not right through here. And again, I mentioned this is maple. Okay, so it does do the job. That was more work than most of my knives would take to go through a piece of wood like this, but it's strong enough to do the job and it's up to it. Again, I'd probably not go with wood this big with this knife, but it's good to know that you can. All right, what I'm gonna do now is just continue to split this down because I'm gonna be looking for a few splits that I can use for the next demonstration. Next demonstration, a little bit of cross batoning and making a knot the standard test I do when I'm doing demonstrations is to make a tent peg out of one of the splits. So that's what I'm going to do with this. Now I can do this uh, cross cutting one of two ways. One would be to uh, just press it in and actually why don't I do that rather than smacking it with the hammer this time or the uh, baton is just to work the knife in. All right. Looks like I may not be able to, wasn't showing you that. And I've got a stop cut and I just clean the notch out, go a little bit deeper. Yeah, it's comfortable enough for this, it's doing the job. 
if I had used the baton, actually let's do the baton at the same time. I can get a little deeper, a little quicker, and then cut that out. There we go. All right, so there is my notch for my tent peg. Of course, now I gotta put a point on it. All right, same split, tent peg notch. Let's flatten off and make a point on this. So I'm holding it in the reverse grip, comfortable enough for my thumb. Again, not so comfortable for here. Let's just work it through. That thin blade makes this quite the slicey knife. It's certainly digging in and doing this task with no issues. So I've got most of it done. There we go. All right, 10 peg, done. All right, so next step would be feather sticking. So of the splits that from that uh, little log, uh, this is what I'm thinking of may be the best for feather sticking. You're looking for something that is straight grained as possible, as few knots as possible, and still wood still in good shape. Now over here on the outside, it was starting to get punky. Here in the core, it's still, really, really hard. There is a bit of a warp down here and a bit of a pinhole over here. So that leaves me this surface to work with. I'm gonna take that first little bit off because it was uh, splitting out. And we'll see how it does for feather sticking. So I just wanna make sure you see everything I'm doing here. Lost that first curl, not uncommon, right? Well, all right. Boy, it's digging in, as you can see. All right, now we're starting to get some smaller curls. If you have to have big curls when you get started, that's no big deal. They help hold the little ones on as you work your way down. But a lot of these are bigger than I would like to have seen them trying to determine if this is the knife or the wood or a combination thereof. Lighten up my grip, find an edge. All right, so here's what I'm finding at this point. I'm not finished, but here's what I'm finding at this point. Uh, it's doing the job. It's just not doing it as well as some other knives that I have. And there could be a couple reasons for that. I'll get to them in a little bit more detail in a moment. But what I'm finding is, is that as I lay the knife down and then lift it up to find that edge, it, it goes from too shallow to too deep just that quickly. So it's not as easy as some knives to find that edge. Now you wouldn't think of it, right? Knives should be all, be, oh, okay, I'm doing better now. <laughs> I guess I found my edge, as they say. I can do little curls very well if I just lighten up and find a nice little tiny ridge. It's getting the long curls that this knife is not doing well with. Now, could that be me? Absolutely, it certainly could be me. I think more likely though, it's the wood. It is seasoned maple. Let's just turn it around and go the other way. There is that uh, where the knot was on the other end of it, but I'm just gonna pull a few curls down in that direction, see what happens. Good chance I'll lose them right off. Yeah, I'm losing them right off where that knot is, so. If I can get to keep a couple on, it'll help. All right, a little bit better. Yeah, go out towards the tip. Oh yeah, that. But boy, this knife likes making those fine little curls. Let me pull those back just to show you what, see if I can capture this. If you go towards the tip, you can get these little, little tiny curls right here. And if you get a half a dozen or so or more of them, they're the, well, as many as you can get, of course, they're the ones that catch a spark from the ferrous cerium rod. So it does really well at the tip. But for bigger curls, it's just not 
Well, let's put it this way. I've had better knives and better success, but uh, okay. Uh, not my best feather stick ever, but enough to show that it can do the job, if not as well as a few other knives. All right, there's only really one more test to do, and that is scraping. Okay, scraping. So uh, with all of my demonstrations, I like to do three types of scraping. One, to see if I can get some fuzz off of a piece of wood, because that will accept a spark very nicely. I have a little chunk of fat wood here, and of course, my ferrous cerium rod. So let's start with the piece of wood. That should be a good spot for it to have a piece of birch bark to collect everything. All right, certainly doing that job. Oh yeah. It scrapes. It scrapes at least this wood, so that's great. I'll save those to add to my little ignition pile here. Will it do the same thing for fat wood? Let's have a look. Oh, of course it will. All right, some fat, woo, love that smell. I always say that, but it's, it's true, right? It's just a great smell. So there is my little pile of fat wood and uh, maple scrapings. Bring it in close enough that I can work on it. Oh, that, yep, it's lit. One scrape, it lit, so that's, that on camera? Good, it is on camera. So it does the job of scraping just fine. All right, we're gonna wrap this video up in a moment, but there is a few comments that I wanted to share with you about this knife as well. And part of the reason I think that it may not have been doing as good a job as I would have liked it to do with the feathering. And I think that has to do with the grind. The closer I look at this grind, it's not very high as you can see, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, it's very thin steel, 2.5 millimeters. It's very, very thin steel. And it's not the fact that it has that secondary edge, that micro bevel on it at all. Neither of those things will uh, seriously affect the knife's ability to do feather sticks. But as I look at this blade and I look at the grind, it doesn't look flat. I've got no way of confirming that, but it feels like it's slightly rounded, almost like a Scandivex. You've heard that term, a combination of convex and Scandi grind. Um, yeah, okay. Really, it, you know, even then, that should not affect the, the performance of the knife all that much. I mean, you should be able to adapt to it very quickly. So, okay, so if this had been the only time that I used it for feather sticking and found that it wasn't doing the job that I would have liked it, then I could say it was an off day for me, or it was the wrong wood, or I didn't have it sharp enough, any number of factors. And maybe it was an off day for me in feather sticking, and maybe it was the wood. But this has been my experience using this all along. It's sufficient, it's just not great. Now, maybe you're okay with that. Maybe you're okay with the fact that it's not an expensive knife to start with, so you can't expect a whole lot with it. And maybe you're not not—you're the person that doesn't mind doing the work to bring the most out of a knife like this because you're, you're really not gonna ruin it by trying to maintain or, or work that edge up to something special. There is something else I noticed about this, and I don't know that it's gonna show up on camera. Look as close to the tip as you can the grind line as it works towards the tip, and then look at it on this side. Not only is it uneven, it looks like the, the grinder rolled it a little bit, so there's a flat spot uh, at the edge itself. Attention to detail. Okay, again, it's a budget knife. I am not holding this out as something that should be absolutely spot on perfect like you would expect from a custom knife. It's a budget knife, right? So it, it, don't expect perfection. You won't be looking for it. You won't find it either in this knife. Now, here comes the part I actually debated whether or not I would do, and it was right up until this moment that I thought I wasn't sure if I wanted to do this or not. And that is compare this against another knife made in Ukraine, a knife that I've previously reviewed on this channel, which is the BPS Adventurer. So I'm gonna bring that knife into the picture so you can see a side by side. The reason I'm doing that is, is these are both budget bushcraft knives of reasonable quality, made in Ukraine, um, Okay, I just want you to be able to make a decision for yourself. So let's bring the BPS Adventurer. You've seen me review this. If you haven't watched it, I'll put the review link in the video description so you can go back to it. 
but uh, right off the top it has a better leather sheath and uh, it's very similar in style in terms of the dangler the leather is just thicker it is attached with rivets I just have more confidence in the sheath and it's stiff and it has a good thick welt running down it I don't even include the fact that it has a ferrocerium rod holder and included rod on it and it is riveted through here it's just overall it's a better quality sheath now if you look at the knife I don't want to belabor this, but let's just bring the two of them into the picture. Okay, so here are the two knives, the top being the BPS Adventurer and the bottom being the Beavercraft Bushcraft knife. Uh, first thing I'm going to say is the Adventurer is slightly thicker stock. Now, not a lot. Where this is 2.5, I think this is 2.75 millimeters. They're both made of the same steel. They're both made of 1066 high carbon steel. It's a very available steel to the knife makers in Ukraine. And I'm not criticizing the steel at all. Yes, you can do a lot better. But again, it has more to do with the heat treat and the design of the knife than anything else. But, uh, all right, first, look at the Allen screws that hold this handle on and then look at the Allen screws that hold this handle on. Look at the, uh, the wood itself. Uh, like there, there are just differences all along. And probably the most telling thing is the grind. Um, again, a Scandi grind, but it's consistent and even all the way through to the tip. It also has a micro bevel on it. A lot of that, it looks a little polished. That's me doing the stropping on um, a lot of stropping. But this one is so sharp. I could never get this knife quite as sharp as I could this knife. And I know this to be a good, a good uh, feather stick maker. So, okay. Uh, I kind of, as I mentioned, I hesitated comparing these two knives. I have not seen anybody else do this. I, I know people don't want to appear to be bashing uh, this knife. I certainly don't want to appear to be bashing this knife, but I just wanted to show you that there are choices when it comes down to supporting Ukraine and purchasing one of the knives made in Ukraine. And uh, since they're both at about the same price, well, I'll leave it up to you, but you know which one I would purchase. Right? Okay? So that's all I have to say. Now, as always, I'll put all the specifications for the BP, or the Bushcraft, <laughs> the Beavercraft knife in the video description below. I'll put the links to where you can take another look at it. I'm going to put the links to the BPS Adventurer so that you can take a, a look at that knife uh, it, as far as my video goes. And uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that. If you have any comments or questions, please put them in the comments section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.